A lesson for January the 31st, 2016. Lesson 9. Taken from Unit 2, which is titled, Four Weddings and a Funeral. A lesson title is Matters of Life and Death. Our devotional reading comes from the book of Isaiah, chapter 25, verses 6 through 10. Our background scripture is from the Gospel of John, chapter 11, verses 1 through 44. And our printed text is from the, also the Gospel of John, verses 38, chapter 11, verses 38 through 44. And our key verse, when he thus had spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. Our lesson aim as a result of studying this lesson, that the students should be able to review the story about the incident in which Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. And that to be able to reflect on why Lazarus' resurrection may have been both a joyous and a sobering event, and also to remember and celebrate the lives of those who have died and affected their faith. Matters of Life and Death We have here in this 11th chapter of the Gospel of John, the testimony of Lazarus being raised from the dead, in which we can see Jesus' tender sympathy and his affection for his afflicted friends, Martha and Mary, who was grieving over the death of their brother Lazarus. We find written in verse 38 of our lesson, it says, Jesus therefore again groaned in himself coming to the grave. It was a cave and a stone laid upon it. Jesus therefore again groaned in himself. It was an expression of his sympathy with his friends in their sorrow. Though Jesus had spoke earlier in the chapter to Martha, about him being the resurrection and the life. We're told also where that when Jesus seen her sister Mary and those with her coming towards him weeping and moaning with great grief, it tells us that Jesus wept. And so we also find out how that Jesus was sympathetic to, to their sorrow and that also how that God is sympathetic to the things that we go through. We find in the book of Isaiah, the 63rd chapter and verse 9, where it states that in all their affliction, he was afflicted. That God concerned, God prophesied about how that the Christ would be concerned and that he would be afflicted when his people are afflicted. And we as the body of Christ, we're supposed to have that same attitude towards one another. And that we as the body of Christ, that we say that we are Christians, okay? And being a Christian is Christ-like. And we are told in 1 John chapter 2, verse 6, where it says that he that says he abided in him, ought himself also to walk even as he walked. So if, if we say that we are in Christ, then we should, our conversation, our, our, our behavior, our life should imitate him towards each other as he had, has shown compassion towards us. So we ought to rejoice with them that do rejoice, and we ought to weep with them that weep. We find in verse 39 of our lesson where it says, where Jesus said to them, Take ye away the stone. Martha, the sister of him that was dead, said unto him, Lord, 
By this time he stinketh, for he has been dead four days. Take away the stone. By doing this, Jesus wanted all those there, especially those that who was close enough to take away the stone, that they could see that that Lazarus was not only dead, but that his body has started decaying and decomposition has begun, and that and that there will be a great stench that come which come from a decaying dead body and by this means that it would prove that there was no deception involved and that in that Lazarus was really dead that he was not in in, in a uh, suspended state that that he was not in a coma and that there was no trickery going on but that Lazarus has actually been dead and he had been dead for some time he had been dead for four days and so now after Mary protesting Jesus had Jesus tells her in verse 40 where he says that Jesus said unto her said I not unto thee that if thou wouldest believe thou shouldest see the glory of God. Jesus had told her earlier that, that he was the resurrection and the life. And he that believeth in him should never die. And he that was dead and believeth in him shall live again. And so now Jesus is reinforcing her faith. He said that if thou wouldest believe, you would see the glory of God. The glory of God. That is a glorious work of God where the glory of his power and his goodness would be displayed. And the Son of God would be glorified. Understand this. To see the glory of God is to see Christ Jesus, who is the being of the Father's glory. He is the express image of the Father. We find in Hebrews second chapter and the ninth verse where it said, but we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. That Jesus is the, the glory of God. His power, his, his goodness towards mankind. We find in verse, verses 41 and 42 of our lesson where it states, where, where it states, I then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laying. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. And I knew that thou heardest me always. But because of the people which stand by, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. That they may believe that thou hast sent me. It was a common opinion during that time that a lot of miracles might be might be done or wrought by the power and in the name of the devil. We'll find that they had even accused Jesus of doing miracles by the power of the demon Beelzebub. And so now Jesus here it says that he lifted up his his eyes to heaven. That is that he lifted up in a manner that showed that he was invoking the supreme God who is above in heaven. He did this before the unbelieving Jews that it might that they might see 
that it was by his power, that is by God's power and God's power only that this miracle was done. And that every hindrance to the people's faith might be taken out of the way once they seen that it was done by the power of God. And that the faith of the people might stand not in the wisdom of men, but in the power of the most high God. For this reason and this reason only, the Lord spoke out loud that the people might see that it was no diabolic or demon influence, but that it was God in his mercy had visited his people. And that the people's faith would stand on the wisdom of God and not upon men. So many times today, people in the church, their faith stand on the wisdom of, of men and not on the power of God. They, they put so much trust into what men say instead of taking hold of to what the word of God says. That they depend so much on men to lead them instead of letting the Holy Spirit through God's word lead them. My brothers and sisters, we need to study the word for ourselves. We need to stop being led about like a bunch of dumb sheep why? Because we are too lazy. We are too lazy to get to know God for ourselves and, and to see the glory of God for ourselves instead of letting somebody else see him for, for us. We need to spend our own personal time with him. We need to spend our own personal time in prayer and in study of God's word and then trust in what God says in his word, not so much what man says out of his mouth. And so that and so that Jesus let them know that what he was doing, that that it was by the power of God, that he came not to glorify himself, but to glorify the Father that sent him. That is the work of the Trinity. The Father sent the Son. The Son glorified the Father. The Holy Spirit, he comes into the world. He comes into the world not to speak of himself, but, but to glorify the Son. And so, and so this should be the work of the church. It's not to talk about Ourself, but is to give God and Jesus Christ the glory. For it, it is by grace that we are saved. It's not that we saved ourselves, but that he saved us. So if there is any, any praise or, or, or any pats on the back that should be done, it, all the glory should be given to God above and to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we find he said that, he, he said that he knew that the folks would listen, so he said that, that they might believe that thou has sent me. God sent the Son into the world. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. God sent the Son in the world not to be ministered unto, but to give his life as a ransom for all. And so we find in verse 43 of our lesson where it states, and when he had just spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. He cried with a loud voice. <clears throat> Jesus had said earlier in, in the fifth chapter of this gospel of John in verse 26 where he says, for as the Father has life in himself, so have he given the Son to have life in himself. In verse 28 of the fifth 
chapter, Jesus says, says, Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in the which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice. Lazarus, come forth. Jesus called him by his name, not only as being his friend that he called him by his name, but to distinguish him from all others that was in the grave. Because as Jesus had said just, Come forth or get up. All the dead would have came out of the grave. But he called Lazarus where he demonstrated his power where he has said that the dead shall hear his voice and come forth out of the grave. And so we see in verse 44 of our lesson it says, And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound about with a napkin. Jesus said unto them, Loose him and let him go. He that was dead came forth. Jesus said unto them, Loose him and let him go. The one that had been dead came out the cave. And that he was restored back to his grieving sisters. Jesus told him to remove the grave clothes, to, to loose him, unbind him, and take the napkin off of his head, the grave napkin off of his head so that he can walk and that he might be able to see and that he could go back and return to his family. But you know, as we look at this section in, in the gospel about Lazarus, it has a deeper meaning than just the restoration from the dead of a dear friend of Jesus and the beloved brother of two sisters. We have to understand that if we look closer, that, that if we would do more than just surface reading, but, but, but we would go in depth in the study of the scriptures, we can see that there is a far greater meaning that is set before us. In the first 10 chapters of John's Gospel, it shows Jesus revealed himself to the Jews in every aspect that, that could possibly gain their faith. And how with each revelation only served to embitter them against him and harden their hearts and unbelief into hopeless hostilities towards him. Jesus manifested himself as the light of the world, yet the darkness comprehended him not. As the shepherd of the sheep, yet they would not hear his voice. He manifested himself as the life of men, and they would not come unto him that they might have life. He showed himself as the embodied love of God, come to dwell among men, sharing their sorrows and their joy. And men hated, hated him the more. The more love he showed as the truth, which would make men free, they chose to serve the father of lies and to do his work. And now, here he reveals himself as the resurrection and the life. And 
possessor of the keys to that which is unaccessible to all others, the power over death. And even with this, as, as you will read later in this 11th chapter, how that they plotted now because of this, his res because of him raising Lazarus for the dead, it was a, an immediate need to kill him. For But we still have to understand this. For Lazarus' resurrection is more than just a picture of physical death. For the true picture of what is happening here in the story of Lazarus, it is the spiritual death of all mankind. All mankind who are dead in trespasses and sin. It is said that Jesus loved Lazarus and his sister. God loved all mankind. And that, and that the same type of love that Jesus displayed for Lazarus and his sisters, the Father displays for us. They had warned Jesus in the earlier part of this 11th chapter that, that, that the Jews there was waiting in Jerusalem to take his life. They was plotting. But because of his love, for his friend, Lazarus and his family, that Jesus was willing to go, to go and to put his life on the line so that his friends might be raised from the dead and, 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 that, and that those who seen this would believe and that his father would get the glory and that for the benefit of those who seen this, that their faith would be strengthened. And so, and, and so it is also with all mankind. Jesus left the safety of his glorious home in heaven to come down here and to dwell among men, to give his life in danger, to give his life as a ransom for all mankind. Because, because that it was a sacrifice that was needed to to pay the sin debt for all mankind that Jesus was willing to pay that. We find what Jesus said in John the fifth chapter verses twenty five, I mean excuse me, twenty four, he said, Well verily, verily I say unto you, he that believeth on my word and believe on him that sent me have everlasting life. And shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. The believer, talking about the church, or made a lie from being spiritually dead because because we were all dead in trespasses and sin. Ephesians two one states that and you have he quickened that is made a lie who were dead in trespasses and sin. But God who is rich in mercy with his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in sin, has quickened us together with Christ. So now, that is, that is a picture. Lazarus is a picture of mankind as a whole being spiritually dead. And just as Jesus called him by name, the God has called to each of us. And those who are answered that that we was 
given. We was risen from the spiritually dead. But even just like as he called Lazarus forth out of being in that grave, he calls us forth out of being in dead and trespasses and sin. And just as he said, when Lazarus came out that cave, that Lazarus still had on those grave clothes. But Jesus told those around him to loose him, to loose him. That what? That he might walk in newness of life. So also, Christ is telling, is saying for us to be loose that 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 though we are still in body in this old sinful body that we have that we can be loose and that and that we can walk not not hindered but we can walk in newness of life that 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 we can through the word of God that 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 the napkins that can be removed from my eye so that we can see clearly how the Lord wants us to live. And that and then how that he wants us after taking upon his word to us is that is that he wants us to walk in newness of life. So it tells us that therefore to let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily beset us and let us run with patience the race that is set before us looking unto Jesus the author and the finisher of our faith who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross despising the shame and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God Yes, this is a beautiful lesson. It shows how that in matters of life and death, that how that the Lord is still with us, how that he is concerned, and that how that he provides the way for us to enjoy the things that he would have us enjoy, life, that we can have life, more abundantly, and then even as part of the curse of sin upon mankind, he said that I will never leave you or forsake you. That that he, when we are afflicted, he is afflicted, and so we have this reassurance that that whatever it is, the Lord said that He will never leave us, forsake us, or forsake us even in the matters of life or death. May the Lord bless you and keep you.